Well, next we need to talk more about the formal charges. We've seen how important it is to use the formal charges to predict the roles that atoms will play. Um, but that raises a question, how do you know what the formal charges for the starting materials are? Now, for each of the reactions we've seen so far, I've drawn the formal charges in for you. Here I showed you what the formal charge was in the starting material. And in this example, I also showed you what the formal charge was in the starting material. But can you trust that that's the way it's going to be on exams? Will the formal charges be presented for you on exams? And the answer is not always. Um, there's a certain type of situation where you're a common type of situation where you're expected to draw in the formal charges yourself. And that is when there are ionic bonds you're expected to notice when there are ionic bonds and draw in the formal charges yourself. So that's our next topic. We have to discuss how to detect when there are ionic bonds so that you can draw in the formal charges. Um, and this is, this is a topic that I would say is probably relevant for the majority, the majority of the SN2 reactions um, and for many other reactions, probably the majority of all the reactions that you're likely to see on your exams. This is an important topic. Um, well, do you know what the difference is between an ionic bond and a covalent bond? Can you define ionic bonds and covalent bonds? Well, here are some definitions that will be helpful to us at this point. Um, we can think of an ionic bond as being based on the attraction between a negative and a positive formal charge. You should know that um, unlike charges attract, and that's the basis of an ionic bond. On the other hand, you should know um, from your general chemistry classes that a covalent bond is based on sharing of electrons. So when you're given the starting materials, how can you tell which bonds are ionic and which bonds are covalent? I hope you came up with an answer. Again, each time I ask a question, I hope that you're pausing the video and coming up with an answer. Well. Covalent bonds tend to form between atoms with relatively small electronegativity differences. And ionic bonds tend to form between atoms with relatively large electronegativity differences. Do you see why that would be? Um, when there are small electronegativity differences, that means that neither atom has that much more um, desire to possess the electrons. Well, when both atoms have roughly similar um, desire to possess the electrons, that's when they're willing to share. That's when they're willing to share the electrons. On the other hand, when there's a large electro electronegativity difference, one atom um, wants the electrons much more than the other. They're not going to be, uh, so it's not going to be willing to share. And in that case, rather than a bond based on sharing of electrons, um, we end up with a bond where um, one atom, one atom kind of uh, possesses the uh, electrons and becomes negative, and one atom loses the electrons and becomes positive, an ionic bond. Covalent bonds form between atoms with small electronegativity differences, ionic bonds between atoms with large electronegativity differences. So how can you tell? How can we put this into practice? How do we know how big the electronegativity differences are? Well, here's a useful rule. Usually, if you have a bond between a non-metal and a non-metal, that will usually be covalent. And usually, if you have a bond between a metal and a non-metal, that will usually be ionic. There are exceptions to these rules. Um, in fact, um, there's exceptions to these rules as well, but these are usually useful rules. Well, you should know that metals tend to be from the left side of the periodic table, and nonmetals tend to be from the right side of the periodic table. So notice that if we have a bond between a nonmetal and a nonmetal, that's a bond between two elements that are close to each other in the periodic table. And if they're close to each other in the periodic table, they probably have a relatively small electronegativity difference. On the other hand, if we have a bond between a metal and a nonmetal, those would tend to be far from each other in the periodic table, and therefore they would tend to have a relatively large electronegativity difference. So these are reasonable rules. So if we're looking for ionic bonds, we should be especially looking for bonds between a metal and a nonmetal. And at this point in the course, at this point in the course for SN2 reactions, there's mainly two metals we're likely to uh, be worried about, sodium and potassium. You can see that sodium and potassium are metals from the far left of the periodic um, 
table, those are the two metals that you're likely to see involved in SN2 type, um, in, in the starting materials for SN2 type reactions. Um, and notice that um, most of the other elements we've been talking about so far are nonmetals. Carbon is a nonmetal. Uh, carbon is a nonmetal. Uh, chlorine, bromine, and iodine are nonmetal. Nitrogen and oxygen are nonmetals. Sulfur is a nonmetal. Uh, one thing I should point out is that even though hydrogen is on the far left of the periodic table, um, hydrogen is an exception. Hydrogen is not a metal. Hydrogen is not a metal. In fact, maybe I'll erase the hydrogen from here. And instead, um, we can put the hydrogen over here in the same cell as carbon. You should know that the periodic table gives us a misleading picture of the electronegativity of hydrogen. Even though hydrogen is in this position in the periodic table, the electronegativity of hydrogen is actually very close to the electronegativity of carbon. So for purposes of electronegativity, um, I'll actually draw the hydrogen here. You can think of hydrogen as almost sharing the same cell as carbon um, because hydrogen is very similar to carbon in electronegativity. And as a result of that, um, even though the official position of hydrogen is over here, hydrogen is actually a non-metal. Hydrogen is a non-metal, uh, just like carbon is a non-metal. That shouldn't surprise you because obviously hydrogen gas is not metallic. Obviously, carbon and hydrogen both play very big roles in organic chemistry, so you should actually memorize this fact. The periodic table does not give you um, a, a good indication of the properties of hydrogen um, as far as electronegativity is concerned. You should memorize that the electronegativity of hydrogen is close to the electronegativity of carbon. It's as if um, hydrogen is really, uh, it's as if hydrogen were in the same cell as carbon in the periodic table, even though its official position would be over here. Okay, so we've learned that ionic bonds tend to form between a metal and a nonmetal. There are some exceptions to that rule, but that's a useful rule for us to work with right now. Now, how is this material relevant for finding the formal charges? Well, it's relevant because of this idea. When atoms in the starting materials are covalently bonded, if there's any formal charges, they will usually already be drawn for you. But when atoms in the starting materials are ionically bonded, as oftentimes happens, you need to use, you will usually need to draw the formal charges yourself. This is uh, this happens very frequently on problems. Again, there are some exceptions to these rules, but they're, they're still useful rules. Now let's try an exercise to practice this important skill. Suppose that each of the following species is provided as the starting material for a reaction. Draw in any necessary formal charges. Let's start with this species. Well, we should notice that here we have a metal and a nonmetal. Sodium is a metal and chlorine is a nonmetal. Sodium from the far left of the periodic table and chlorine from the right hand side. So we know that this is a ionic combination. And when there is an ionic combination, um, we have to draw in the formal charges. Well, which should be positive and which should be negative? Chlorine is from, from the right side of the periodic table. It wants electrons more. It's going to grab the electrons to itself and become negative. Sodium is from the left side of the periodic table. It wants the electrons a lot less, so it will give up its electrons and become positive. Remember, electrons have a negative charge. So if the chlorine grabs electrons, it becomes negative. And when the sodium loses electrons, it becomes positive. So here we've drawn in the formal charges. If we didn't realize that this was an ionic bond, we wouldn't realize that there's this crucial negative charge on the chlorine. That'll play a big role in predicting um, what will happen in the reaction. On the other hand, this molecule has all covalent bonds. All the bonds in this molecule are covalent. Carbon and chlorine are both non-metals from the right side of the periodic table, so they would be covalently bonded. Um, carbon, uh, the carbon-carbon bond is covalent, and of course there's also hidden carbon-hydrogen bonds. There's hidden carbon-hydrogen bonds, but remember that we've learned that hydrogen is um, a non-metal with similar electronegativity to carbon. So um, the hydrogen-carbon bond would also be covalent. So all the bonds are covalent. And that, therefore, since there were no formal charges drawn for us, we can probably trust that there are no formal charges. 
if there was a formal charge in a covalent compound, it probably would have been drawn for you in a starting material. So we can trust that there are no formal charges, no formal charges in this starting material. So that's the basic process. Look for ionic bonds in the starting materials. Um, when there's ionic bonds in the starting materials, you need to draw in the formal charges. In covalent compounds, um, you don't need to draw in the formal charges, usually. Let's try that exercise here. Um, you might want to pause the video if you haven't done so already and, and try these exercises on your own. Um, let's try this exercise. Well, this compound is completely covalently bonded. Um, all these atoms are nonmetals. Carbon, bromine, and the hidden hydrogens are nonmetals. They're all covalently bonded, so we don't need to add any formal charges. On the other hand, potassium is a metal, and bromine is a nonmetal, so here we have an ionic bond. Again, bromine wants the electrons more because it's from the far right of the periodic table, and potassium wants the electrons left, uh, less because it's from the far left, so the bromine will grab the electrons and get a negative charge, where uh, negative formal charge, where the potassium is positive. By the way, we said that um, all of these bonds um, and all of these bonds were covalent, um, and we could tell that because they were all bonds between nonmetals and other nonmetals. Uh, but there's another way. There's another way to tell they were covalent using this rule. Any bond that's represented by a solid line is covalent. Any bond represented by a solid line is covalent. So notice here we have um, two bonds represented by solid lines, so we can assume they're covalent. Here there's three bonds represented by solid lines, so we could assume that those bonds are uh, covalent. Um, and also if you have any bond represented by a wedge or a dash, that would be covalent. For example, we could represent the two hidden hydrogens on this carbon, um, one on a dash and one on a wedge. We would, uh, and again, the fact that we're drawing them with a wedge and a dash um, takes for granted that they're covalent. So any bond represented by a solid line or by a wedge or by a dash is covalent. Ionic bonds are never represented by a solid line or by a dashed line or by a wedge. So that means there were two different ways to see that these compounds were covalent. We could see that these two compounds were covalent um, because all the bonds were between nonmetals and other nonmetals, and we could also see that the bonds were covalent um, because uh, um, some of the bonds at least were represented. Uh, well, we could see that the bonds that were represented by solid lines were covalent um, because of this rule. On the other hand, notice that um, not all covalent bonds are re represented by solid lines. For example, all these bonds between these atoms, all of the bonds between these atoms are covalent because they're all between um, nonmetals and they're not represented by solid lines. So a covalent bond can be represented by a solid line, but a covalent bond could also be represented by just writing, um, writing the elements close to each other. In this case, the, way, the reason we know that these are covalent bonds is be, uh, between these atoms in the circle is because the atoms in the circle are all nonmetals. One lesson here is that you should never write something like this. You should never write something like this. You should not represent this ionic bond with a solid line. That would be wrong. It's wrong because ionic bonds should never be represented by a solid line or by a dashed line or by a wedge. So it's wrong to represent this ionic bond with a solid line. How should we represent the ionic bond? Like this. Just draw the sodium and the chloride close to each other and show that it's ionic and not covalent by drawing in the formal charges that are attracting each other above the atoms never represent an ionic bond by a solid line or a dash or a wedge. Those are reserved for covalent bonds. Now let's try this example. Well, all the atoms in this molecule are covalently bonded. They're all nonmetals. Carbon, nitrogen, and the hidden hydrogens are all nonmetals. They're covalently bonded, so we don't need to add any formal charges. Um, but here we have a ionic bond between a metal and a uh, nonmetal. So we would expect that uh, the carbon would have a negative formal charge and the sodium would have the positive formal charge. Carbon is further to the right than sodium in the periodic table, so the carbon will pull the electrons to itself. How do I know that the ionic bond is between the sodium and the carbon rather than between the sodium and the nitrogen? Well, simply because the sodium is written close to the carbon in the formula. 
Uh, since the sodium is written close to the carbon in the formula, we know that the ionic, ionic bond is between the sodium and the carbon, not between the sodium and the nitrogen. By the way, this is an important species. It's called cyanide. It might, this comes up a lot in OCHEM, so it might also just be worth memorizing that in cyanide, the negative charge is on um, the carbon. Um, notice that this would not be considered cyanide because this is neutral. There's a big difference between a, a neutral CN and a CN with a negative charge. The CN with a negative charge is considered uh, cyanide. Um, this neutral CN would not be called a cyanide. Charges make all the difference in organic chemistry. Uh, going to this compound, all of these bonds, uh, well, these are all nonmetals. Oxygen is a nonmetal. We've learned that hydrogen is a nonmetal because it's similar to carbon. Uh, despite its position in the periodic table, hydrogen is a non-metal. So this would be a completely covalent compound, water, um, so we don't need to add any charges. On the other hand, here we have an ionic bond between the metal sodium and um, the uh, non-metal oxygen. So we can put in the formal charges. The more electronegative oxygen pulls the electrons towards itself and becomes negative. By the way, notice that this bond is covalent between two nonmetals, so we don't have to add any extra charges for that bond. Just like over here, this bond between the uh, these bonds actually between the carbon and the nitrogen, any bonds between the carbon and the nitrogen would be covalent because they're two nonmetals. So we don't have to add, add any extra charges for those bonds, only for the ionic bonds. Here we have an ionic bond between the oxygen and the sodium. So the oxygen will have a negative charge and the sodium will have a positive charge. How do I know that the negative charge is on the oxygen and the positive charge is on the sodium? Well, oxygen is further to the right in the periodic table, so oxygen wants electrons more than sodium. So the oxygen will pull the electrons close to itself and pulling the negative electrons to itself would give it the negative charge. The sodium, which wants electrons less, is willing to give up its negative electrons, which leaves the sodium positive. Notice that in our previous examples, the positive charge was on the left and the negative charge is on the right. But in this example, the positive charge is on the right and the negative charge is on the left. Obviously, what matters is not um, uh, left and right, what matters is where the metal is um, written in the formula and where the nonmetal is written in the formula. This is which of the elements wants electrons more and which element wants electrons less. Which element is closer to the right side of the periodic table and which element is closer to the left side of the periodic table. I know the sodium is ionically bonded to the oxygen, not to uh, the carbons, because the sodium is written close to the oxygen, not to the carbons. All these other bonds are covalent. All the other bonds are between two nonmetals, so the other bonds are all covalent, and there's no need to draw any extra formal charges for the other bonds. And all, the, um, all these elements are nonmetals. All of these elements are nonmetals. These are all covalent bonds, and there's no need to draw any extra formal charges. I took my time on these examples, but I hope that you can see that with practice, you can very quickly add the necessary formal charges for ionic bonds. Um, now, um, you should know that there is a formula for calculating formal charges. There is a formula that you might have studied for your first uh, midterm for organic chemistry. There's a formula for calculating formal charges. The formula is based on counting the covalent bonds and the lone pairs around an atom. If you count the covalent bonds and lone pairs around an atom, there's a formula that will let you calculate formal charges. But the point I want to make is notice that we didn't need that formula here. You usually don't need to use the formula for formal charges in organic chemistry. You usually do not have to use the formula for, formal, for calculating formal charges in organic chemistry because there's a much faster approach. The much faster approach is that if you see an ionic bond, you can quickly draw in the formal charges as we've shown here. And if you see a covalent compound, you can trust, if you see a covalent compound in your starting materials, you can trust that um, there are no formal charges unless they were drawn for you. These are the rules that will usually work in OCHEM. So, um, unless the problem is specifically designed to test formal charges, unless the problem is specifically designed to test formal charges,
um, you usually do not need to use the formal charges formula um, in the rest of your um, OCHEM class. You can usually just use these rules as we've demonstrated here. So remember to particularly watch out at this point for sodium and potassium. Those are what you will probably see in ionic bonds at this point in your class. Um, at this point in your class, you should watch out for sodium and potassium. Those are the elements that we uh, usually use at this point to form ionic bonds with these nonmetals, sodium and potassium. Now, why is it so important that we were able to identify these formal charges? Well, remember, because we use the formal charges to predict the roles that atoms are likely to play in reactions. For example, we would expect this negative chlorine to act like a nucleophile because of its negative charge. On the other hand, we would expect this neutral chlorine to act as a leaving group because that's what neutral chlorines do. We would expect this negative bromine to act like a nucleophile because of its negative charge. But we would expect um, this neutral bromine to act like a leaving group because that's what neutral halogens do. We would expect this negative carbon to act like a nucleophile because of its negative charge. We would expect this negative oxygen to act like a nucleophile because of its negative charge. And this negative oxygen could act like a nucleophile because of its negative charge. By the way, um, there are other roles. There are other roles that negative oxygens, or at least one other role that a negative oxygen could play, but we are not getting into that right now. One role we could expect a negative oxygen to play is nucleophile. Um, and uh, you would expect these to be good nucleophiles, in fact, because of their negative charges. You wouldn't realize what good nucleophiles these oxygens were or um, that this cyanide was if you hadn't put in this negative formal charge. Now, um, but what about the positive metals? What role do we expect the positive metals to play in the reaction? We've said that the atoms with um, uh, formal charges are most likely to participate in the reaction but here we have to learn an exception to that rule um, because metals with positive charges usually do not participate in reactions. Metals with positive charges usually do not participate in reactions. The atoms with formal charges are usually the most likely to participate in the reaction. But there is an exception. A metal with a positive formal charge usually does not participate in the reaction. Therefore, metals with positive formal charges are usually called spectator ions. They're called a spectator because a spectator does not participate in an event. If you're a spectator at an event, you're not participating in the event, you're just kind of watching from the sidelines, so to speak. So a spectator ion is something which does, is something which does not participate um, in the reaction. Well, metals with positive formal charges are usually spectator ions, which do not participate in the reaction. Again, there are some exceptions, but this will be a useful rule for us for the time being. So, what role would we expect this positive sodium to play in the reaction? Uh, well, none. It'll just be a spectator ion. What role do we expect this positive potassium to play in the reaction? None. It'll just be a spectator ion. What role do we expect this positive sodium to play in the reaction? None. It'll just be a spectator ion. So this is a good time to learn this important rule. Um, pos uh, this, uh, formal charges. Formal charges usually make atoms want to participate in a reaction, but metals with positive formal charges are an important exception to that rule. Metals with positive formal charges are usually unreactive. Um, as far, uh, this is a good rule. This is a good rule for the um, reactions that you'll be studying in your introductory OCHEM class. This is a rule for the reactions that you'll see in introductory OCHEM. Let's practice what we just discussed. Please pause the video and try this problem. Well, our, um, I, suppose, I suppose we can actually start by numbering these carbons. But then our next step is to assign the formal charges using the techniques we just talked about. We should notice that this is an ionic compound between a metal and a nonmetal, so we can put in the formal charges. Negative on the nonmetal, positive on the metal. Now let's try to predict the roles that these atoms will play in reactions, and we want to start by focusing on the atoms with formal charges. Well, the iodide has a negative formal charge, which makes us expect it to be the nucleophile. What about the sodium with the positive formal charge? 
Well, we've learned that um, a metal with a positive formal charge is probably going to is well is usually a spectator which will not participate. So we expect that this is not going to play any role in the reaction besides the unreactive spectator ion. Uh, then we can say uh, this carbon two has a delta positive because it's attached to the chlorine. So carbon two will be our electrophilic atom. The chlorine will be our leaving group. You can also say that carbon-2 will be the alpha carbon. And we can draw the mechanism now. Now remember that this mechanism would not make sense if we hadn't drawn in the charges. If we hadn't drawn in the charges, there would be no particular reason to expect this iodide to be a nucleophile. After all, we don't expect the chlorine to be a nucleophile. The chlorine is neutral, so we don't expect this chlorine to act like a nucleophile. Well, if we had drawn the iodide as being neutral, there would be no reason to expect the iodide to be a nucleophile either. So that shows that it's really crucial to draw in these formal charges. Without the formal charges, we can't understand why the iodide is acting like a nucleophile rather than the chlorine acting like a nucleophile. So it really is important to identify ionic bonds and draw in the formal charges. Um, now the iodide will attack from the side opposite the chlorine, so the iodide will end up on a dash. and will change two charges. The chlorine gains electrons to become negative and the iodide loses electrons to become neutral. Now in this picture the sodium was ionically bonded to the iodide. Should I show the sodium still ionically bonded to the iodide in this picture? Should the sodium still be ionically bonded to the iodide in this picture? You might want to think about that. Well, re remember that the reason that the sodium was ionically bonded to the iodide, that was based on their charges the positive sodium was attracted to the negative iodide. The positive sodium was attracted to the negative iodide. That was the basis of the ionic bond. But remember that in the products, the iodide has become neutral. Remember that in the products, the iodide has become neutral. It started negative, but it lost electrons, so it became one step less negative, and the iodide became neutral. But the iodide is neutral, it's impossible for it to retain an ionic bond with the sodium, right? Remember. Remember, an ionic bond is based on an attraction between a negative and a positive formal charge. So once the iodide loses its formal charge, it's impossible for the iodide to retain this ionic bond. So this is wrong. This is wrong. The sodium should no longer be shown next to the iodide. The sodium should no longer be drawn next to the iodide. It can no, the sodium can no longer be ionically bonded to the iodide because the iodide has lost its charge. So where should we draw the sodium? Well, the simplest and best thing to do is just don't draw the sodium at all in the products. Professors usually don't care about the sodium because it's just a spectator in this reaction. So the professors, professors will usually accept it if you just um, ignore the sodium in the rest of the reaction. So the simplest and the best approach is simply don't draw the spectator ion at all in the products. The best approach is don't draw the spectator ion at all in the products. We're not interested in this spectator because it's not participating in the reaction. So the professor um, doesn't uh, usually will not require you to draw it in the products. So now we've added a new item of the things we have to do for each reaction in our checklist. Um, after you number all the carbons, you should immediately check for ionic bonds and draw formal charges for any ionic bonds because until you've drawn the formal charges for the ionic bonds, you can't tell what roles the atoms will play. Remember, we had uh, there was no way to tell that this iodide would play the role of a nucleophile until we had drawn in the negative formal charge for the ionic bond. So let's add this to our checklist of things to do for every reaction. Again, try to get in the habit as a beginning OCHEM student of carrying out each of these steps for every reaction that you're working on. Looks like I didn't follow my own advice. I didn't number the carbons in the product. Let's go ahead and do that. Um, why, are, why is it so important to number all the carbons? Um, because otherwise, well, for one reason is students tend to misdraw the carbon chain if they don't number all the carbons.
Um, for example, if you don't number all the carbons, if you don't number all the carbons, it's easy to accidentally make a mistake like this. If you don't number all the carbons, it's easy to accidentally drop a carbon. Do you see that this is a mistake? I've dropped a carbon that existed over here, but without numbers, it's hard to see that I've made that mistake. Um, when students don't number all the carbons, they very frequently accidentally add or drop carbons in their products. So to avoid accidentally adding, so again, you could also easily, you might um, easily accidentally add a carbon. Do you see this is also wrong because it has too many carbons, but it's hard to tell it has too many carbons without the numbers. So one of the reasons, one of the reasons that you should number all the carbons in the starting material and the products is it makes you much less likely to accidentally add or drop a carbon. Notice that if I force myself to number all of these carbons, I'll notice, oh, wait a second, there's an extra carbon here that shouldn't be here. By forcing ourselves to number, we um, force ourselves to notice when we've accidentally added or dropped a carbon. That's one reason why it's really valuable for beginners to number all the carbons in both the starting materials and the products. Please pause the video and try this problem. Uh, well, I'll start by putting in some numbers for all the carbons. That includes this carbon, and it also includes this carbon. Number all the carbons in all the starting materials. That's the best habit for a beginning student. Now, before we do anything else, we need to look for ionic bonds and assign charges. Well, sodium is a metal, carbon is a nonmetal, so here we have an ionic bond between positive sodium and negative carbon. On the other hand, all the bonds in this molecule are covalent. There's are all covalent bonds, so there's no any there's no extra formal charges we have to assign here. Remember that the negative charge is on the carbon, not on the nitrogen, because the carbon is ionically bonded to the sodium, not the nitrogen is ionically bonded to the sodium, and we know that because the carbon is written next to the sodium. Also, though, you should probably just have memorized that this is cyanide and that the negative charge is on the carbon in cyanide. Now we can assign our roles. Now that we see this negative charge on the carbon, we know that this carbon will be nucleophilic. Um, because it's bonded to the iodide, carbon-1 can be said to have a delta positive charge, which will make carbon-1 electrophilic. This is a neutral iodine, and those we've memorized are good leaving groups. Notice that there's no delta charges over here. This carbon and this carbon and these hydrogens all have similar electronegativity, so there's no delta charges over here, so there's no reason to think that there's any electrophiles in this part of um, the molecule, only on carbon-1. You can see again how crucial it was to put in these charges. Um, once we put in the negative charge, we know that carbon-8 will be the nucleophile. But if we had not put in this negative charge, we'd have no idea who to use as the nucleophile. Why should we use carbon-8 as the nucleophile? Why not use carbon-2 or carbon-3 or carbon-7 or carbon-5 as the nucleophile? Until we put in the formal charges, we can't tell, see any important difference between carbon-8 and all the other carbons. But once we put in this formal charge because of the ionic bond, we, see, we, can, we can see that carbon-8 is very different from all the other carbons. All the other carbons here are neutral. Carbon-8 is the only carbon in these starting materials with a negative formal charge. That's why this is the carbon that will be the nucleophile. By the way, this is the first time we've seen a carbon that acts like a nucleophile. Um, previously, when we used carbons in reactions, we were only using them as electrophiles uh, because uh, previously the carbons that participated in the reactions all had delta positive charges, which made them electrophilic. This is the first carbon we've seen with a negative formal charge, which makes it nucleophilic. So we can draw our mechanism. The nucleophile attacks the alpha carbon and the leaving group leaves the alpha carbon. Now the nucleophile will attack from the side opposite to the leaving group. So since the leaving group is behind the page, our nucleophile will come in from in front of the page and end up on a wedge.
So here's carbon-8 um, that just come in um, on a wedge. Remember to change two charges. This carbon is losing electrons, um, so it changes from negative to neutral. And this iodide is gaining electrons, so it changes from neutral to negative. And of course, the atom in the middle of the series doesn't change its charge, so this carbon is now neutral. So should we still draw the sodium next to the carbon? Should we still draw the sodium next to the carbon? No. Over here, the sodium was next to the carbon because they were ionically bonded. The positive was attracted to the negative. But since the negative charge has disappeared from this carbon, there's no reason for it to attract the sodium anymore. So this ionic bond has now broken because the carbon doesn't have a charge anymore. So how should we draw the sodium? Well, remember, the best way to handle the sodium is just don't draw it in the products at all. Since the sodium was an unreactive spectator ion, we don't, we're not really interested in it. So the best approach is just to leave the sodium out of the products. Now, what about this nitrogen? Should the nitrogen still be drawn close to the carbon? What do you think? Well, remember that the nitrogen was covalently bonded to the carbon. The nitrogen is covalently bonded to the carbon. Um, we know that because they're two non-metals. And um, so should we break those covalent bonds? Well, no. You only break covalent bonds when there's an arrow telling you to break it. For example, we broke this covalent bond between carbon-1 and the iodide because this arrow told us to break the bond. There is no arrow telling us to break the bond between um, the carbon and the nitrogen, and therefore we do not break the covalent bonds between the carbon and the nitrogen. So here's the rule that we just learned. We should only break a covalent bond when an arrow, an electron pushing arrow, tells us to break it. And the way an electron pushing arrow tells us to break the bond is when the covalent bond is at the tail of the arrow. Notice how this covalent bond is at the tail of this electron pushing arrow. That's how we knew we had to break the bond between carbon-1 and the iodide. But this, um, uh, this arrow tail is not on the bonds, it's on a lone pair. We drew um, this at, at tail on a, a lone pair, not on the bonds. That indicates that we should not break the covalent bonds between the carbon and the nitrogen. Never break a covalent bond unless the arrow tells you to break it, and the arrow tells you to break a, a covalent bond when the tail of the arrow is on the covalent bond. So since the carbon was covalently bonded to the nitrogen in this picture, um, and there's no arrow telling us to break those bonds, the nitrogen should still be covalently bonded to the carbon in this picture. So it would be a huge mistake to leave out the nitrogen. If you leave out the nitrogen, you will definitely lose a lot of credit on this problem, because this is not the right product. This is the right product. Carbon-8 drags the nitrogen along, so to speak, when it joins carbon-1. Carbon, the carbon-8 is dragging the nitrogen along as it attacks carbon-1, so the nitrogen should still be bonded to carbon-8 in this picture. So to review, when do you break an ionic bond? Well, whenever um, one of the atoms from the ionic bond loses its charge, you automatically break the ionic bond. Um, this carbon lost its negative charge, so we broke the ionic bond between the carbon and the sodium. But we handle covalent bonds quite differently. Um, we only break covalent bonds when there's, a, when there's an electron pushing arrow that tells us to break the covalent bond. Treat ionically um, So that's a good example of how we need to treat ionic bonds quite differently from covalent bonds. By the way, these are rules that I'm taking my time on because these are rules that you're going to use not just for SN2 reactions, but for almost all the remaining reactions you'll study in the entire um, remainder of your OCHEM class. Now, I'd also like to discuss the stereochemistry here at carbon-5. We know that SN2 um, cr creates an inversion of configuration. We inverted the configuration at carbon-1 from um, the iodide on a dash to the cyanide on a wedge. Should we also invert the configuration at carbon-5? Should I change carbon-5 to a dash? So um, what do you think? Should we change um, this bond from a wedge to a dash in the SN2 reaction, or should we leave it as a wedge? Pause the video and come up with your answer. Well, I hope that your answer was, there's no reason to change the stereochemistry at carbon-5, because carbon-5 is not participating in the reaction. You can see from the electron-pushing arrows that carbon-5 is just not participating in the reaction. 
Since carbon-5 is not participating in the reaction, there's no reason to change the stereochemistry at carbon-5. In the starting material, carbon-7 was in front of the page, and carbon-7 will still be in front of the page in the product. So the correct picture is this one. This is the correct picture. If you drew carbon-7 on a dash, that would be wrong. That would be a mistake. Remember that the reason we inverted the configuration at carbon-1 is because the cyanide had to attack carbon-1 from the side opposite the leaving group. The cyanide has to attack carbon-1 from the side opposite the leaving group, um, and that's what causes the configuration to invert at carbon-1. Um, but this nucleophile is not attacking carbon-5. Since the nucleophile is not attacking carbon-5, there is no reason to invert the configuration at carbon-5. So we can see that we need to update this rule that we learned earlier in the video. Here's the rule that we learned earlier in the video. Do you see how we need to update this? Um, I guess what I should have said is that we will get inversion of configuration at the alpha carbon. SN2 will create an inversion of configuration at the alpha carbon, which was carbon 1 in this reaction. There's no reason, there's no reason to expect inversion of configuration at any of the other carbons, such as carbon 5. We only get inversion of configuration at the carbon that's participating in the SN2, which is the alpha carbon. That gives us another good reason to actually identify and label the alpha carbon in our starting material. So um, if you saw this problem on an exam, it would be a kind of a trap. This would be a trap uh, because the professor knows that many students think that SN2 means that you invert all the configurations. So many students would get this wrong because they would um, thoughtlessly invert the configuration at carbon-1 and at carbon-5. So now that we understand this, uh, hopefully we can avoid that type of trap if we see it on exams. All right, well, we've now discussed how we can use ionic bonds to identify formal charges. And we've seen why that's an important skill for SN2 reactions. In the next video in this series, we'll proceed to our next SN2 topic. But before we do that, let's try a brief review quiz. First question. What is the most important tool for drawing the correct electron pushing arrows? Here's the answer. Formal charges are the most important tool for drawing the correct electron pushing arrows. Next question. What types of formal charges are likely to go at the beginning, middle, and end of a series of electron pushing arrows? So try identifying what types of formal charges are likely to go at the beginning, middle, and end of this series of electron pushing arrows. Pause the video and try that. Well, here's the answer. Here is our answer. Now, remember, you shouldn't have to have this information memorized. You should be able to figure it out. Remember, these arrows show the movement of electrons, and the charge on an electron is negative. Well, um, so the arrows would like to start on a negative charge. Um, something with a negative charge would like um, to donate electrons. Electrons like moving away from something that's negative so that the thing that's negative can get back to a uh, neutral. It's also okay for the thing in this position to be neutral, but um, the atom at the beginning of the series would almost never be positive. Again, if something has a positive charge, it should make sense that it wants to go at the end of the series of arrows so that electrons will move towards it. Um, if negative electrons move towards a positive, that would make the positive neutral, which is what nature likes. It's also okay to put a neutral atom here, but you would almost never put a negative atom at the end of the series of arrows we would almost always put a neutral atom in the middle of the series of arrows. It would be quite rare to put a negative or a positive charge in the middle of the series of arrows. There are some exceptions uh, to this rule, but they're pretty rare. This is the general rule. Remember here that we're talking about formal charges. We're not talking here about delta charges. This is absolutely crucial information for your success in organic chemistry. Um, on almost every problem, you're going to need to draw electron pushing arrows. Your most important tool for getting the correct arrows is the formal charges, uh, because you would like to put negative charges at the beginning of the series of arrows, or neutral, positive charges at the end of the series of arrows, or neutral, and neutral atoms 
in, um, in the middle of the series of arrows. Here is an example where we put a negative atom at the beginning of the series of arrows, a neutral atom in the middle of the series of arrows, and another neutral atom at the end of the series of arrows. We did not put the positive sodium at the end of the series of arrows, even though it's positive because we've memorized that um, positive metals like sodium are usually unreactive spectator ions. In this reaction, the only atom with a positive charge was an unreactive metallic spectator ion. So in this reaction, instead of putting a positive atom at the end of the series of arrows, we put a neutral atom at the end of the series of arrows. But we were able to put a negative atom at the beginning of the series of arrows. You can proceed now to the next video in this series, where we will discuss the next SN2 topic. Did you find this video to be helpful? If so, you can support the videos by making a monthly pledge of $1 or more at my Patreon page. You can visit my Patreon page by clicking the link on the screen or by using the link in the video description box. Thank you.